The Emperor sent Rex to make war against the rebellious duo Maximus and Severianus, together being the most powerful authority in the Roman Empire aside from himself. In a series of battles and skirmishes, the Magister and Lucius Verus had carved a path from Europe to Antioch and defeated Severianus' army. With Maximus behind unassailable walls, the army returned with an indecisive victory, yet they had proven that victory was possible. This raised the question of whether a victory achieved by such a method was really in Rome's best interests. Inside the huge temple of Neptune at Tarentum, Emperor Marcus Aurelius met with his advisors and officers. The original purpose of the meeting was to react to the arrival of Roman Asian forces in Italy. Word arrived from Rex a few hours in, stating that he was en route to repel the invasion and reporting his various victories in the east. This caused a greater uproar than the attacking army. This is exactly what the likes of Caesar would do, one noble claimed. His men are left perpetually drunk by the energies of their victories, and so they follow him under arms right to our very homes, and then what? We are to deny him anything he asks? Gods be praised that he did not return with the head of the traitor, for then what indignity would be too much for him to demand? This sentiment was repeated by many, with officers concerned that Rex was winning glory with their troops, and with politicians noting how Rex's popular acclaim, especially outside of Italy, was a far greater threat to the Empire than Maximus's pretendership. The day was coming to an end when Aurelius finally took the floor. Each noble gentleman here has voiced a valid concern that troubles me also. However, I believe you all take for granted the services rendered by our interim magister. Concerns that our debts are too great are nothing to be scoffed at, but imagine for a moment if we owed that debt to no one at all. Imagine if it was not just one legion outside the gates, but ten. Imagine if there was not a veteran, well-regulated army with experienced officers taking the initiative to defeat this threat even before we convened here today. Is it not the case that we have the least troubling of the many possible histories these times could produce? There was a period of silence where none retorted. Many thought of retorts without saying them. Those who were willing to speak out against the Emperor were those same men who had previously sided with Maximus, men for whom reopening that political wound was not worth another jive at the Emperor's bias. When a voice rang out, it was a German one. It was the man who had brought word from Rex, Oliver, a man Aurelius had used for similar duties himself over the years. Regni Novanti may conspire with Rex against you. He said nothing else that day, and nor need he, for that statement alone opened a lid of complaints among the assembly that covered all the major conspiracy theories of the day. The Emperor became enraged at the suggestions, and the session was ended without any edicts decided upon. He returned to his quarters, and was soon back in the company of the broadly insulted Briton woman. What's wrong? Regni asked at once. Aurelius washed his face, then replied, I wish I wasn't the Emperor. Don't be like that. You mustn't tempt the gods. I don't tempt them. I don't tempt them at all. They think nothing of me. My fate is in your hands, and those of your brother. Regni found this flattering, but had Aurelius not refused to elaborate on why he thought that, she wouldn't have. Hello and welcome back to Rex Romanum, where we've got a 20-day truce with Roman Asia to allow ourselves to rebuild so that we can just go and attack them again. While at home, there are various things to deal with, there were lots of invasions still going on. Here was one case where my tried and tested dueling strategy didn't work very well because the other guy had a shield. Almost got a cheeky headshot there, but in the end had to actually fight with my own sword and shield. We did go outside of the ring, which apparently is allowed, so I guess that's just there for show. 
in the ensuing battle, we have the heavy infantry advantage, so our infantry block just pushed right through the enemy's one. But then the enemy's archers were really hammering us from this hill just opposite. I'm going to run away for a second and get our cav to go and finish that off. They were busy killing a few enemy cav. Once we're finally in amongst them, that's going to be this battle won. There were several battles of this ilk going on at about this time, because the enemy have just been invading Italy constantly, especially while I was away, so we did take a lot of damage. But the issue isn't that bad, because they can't take any of our cities, meaning they can't do any lasting damage. Ferentium, one of my personal villages, had actually been taken over by bandits, so I decided to try and clear this up. But I forgot that when you try to attack bandits in a village, you can't bring your army to do it. You're limited, I think, to have roughly the same number of troops as the enemy, but because you have to fight with the farmers on your side, we didn't get any of our regular troops. That meant it's just me, basically. That's our heavy infantry component, and we've got a few archers and calf to back up our farmer contingent. And things don't go very well, not only because I'm on horse there, but our entire army is taken down, or what our army is for this battle. Then it was just me against all the remaining enemies. This went okay for a while, but their constant arrow fire broke my shield and then took me down. Not the end of the world or anything, we don't get captured by the bandits or something like that. It just means the village is looted, which is standard fare for my villages. While I was away, they were all constantly looted, <laughs> so really it's just back to normal. Anyway, so my main objective now is to build up a slightly bigger army, train up some new troops before we head out to take the enemy down. Several more very small invasions came in, and in these cases we can just do things like this. Use the skirmishing option to kill off a quarter of the enemy army right away, then auto resolve the rest to save ourselves some time. So that happened quite a few times, then there was one slightly bigger attack that came in, in the north. And this time I was pleased to see that our allied officers Looked like they might consider maybe stopping the enemy. It's getting closer and closer. They were in the field at the same time as the enemy army. There was a chance they would actually try and fight to stop them going down to central Italy. Anyway, so I jumped in on this fight and it was another relatively easy one because these Germanic armies lack for heavy infantry. We can just pile right through them really. Don't even need to bother with strategy, but doing a bit of strategy makes it easier. After that, we now come to the end of the truce period with Roman Asia. So it's time to start building up a new force to go out and try to take Antioch. I went to find Verus and I was annoyed to see that he hasn't actually built his army back up to where it was before. He had some 400 troops when we moved out last time and he's still got only the ones he had at the end of the previous campaign right now, which is a bit annoying. I thought the AI would just respawn its troops automatically, but maybe he was already over his cap. We also got several peace treaties at around this time, with various barbarian clans who just aren't bothering to attack us, so that makes us look better at the very least. We're seemingly making the Empire more safe. So yes, we're going to team up with more than just Varus this time, since he doesn't have that many men. I do want to attack with more men than we attacked with last time. But, as we'll see, even taking a large force over to Antioch doesn't necessarily guarantee anything good's going to happen. Gilana waved Rex off as he and the other officers mounted their horses in Verus's courtyard and rode for the army camp outside of Syracuse. This time they were ready. They had more troops and heavy equipment, the baggage train had supplies for a long siege, and the coming of spring brought forgiving weather for marching in the sun-baked east. Also leaving were messengers bound for Rome and Tarentum, reporting on Rex's negotiations with foreign ambassadors. More tribes were ceasing their attacks on Rome and officially denouncing Maximus in exchange for peace with the greater empire. The pieces were falling into place, but not everyone was working from the same plan. The army's march to Antiochia was not contested this time. The Anatolian territories politely accommodated the Italians and provided ships with which to hasten their advance. The host landed in Antiochia's detached ports without issue and disembarked onto the road to the city proper. It was just as they had left it. The walls and gates were fully manned, with locals claiming Maximus had taken over as governor while the consular army had gone east with Severianus to regroup after its defeat. Rex ordered his army to encamp near the city and prepare ladders for an attack as soon as possible. Almost as soon as the runners had carried these commands to the relevant officers, said officers converged on the Praetorium in the main camp. It's just as we feared, Varus said once the party reached Rex's desk. You're going to throw our men at those walls, wager their lives against your own glory. It's not like that, Rex protested. 
Maximus has allies in the field. We have to strike before they get here. I know what my brother promised you, boy, Verus snapped. You want to usurp the Imperial throne. The other officers threw out the same accusation in various guises, while Rex battled to stop the mud from sticking. You know as well as I that the only way to end the rebellion is to round up all the leaders. Severianus is more of a criminal than Maximus now, and Maximus is a useless sack of sand who wouldn't dare make a move against us. You fought with him, didn't you? You can't pretend he's a threat to Rome. So why focus on him? Why leave the rest of the rebels at large? Your scheme was too obvious, Britain. You will supplant Maximus and have the rebels support you instead. That is why you've had your sister poisoning the ear of the Emperor while you corrupt my daughter and why you've been meeting with barbarian ambassadors behind our backs. This is the final stage of your plan. Admit it. Verus's prosecution was backed by a growing racket from the lesser officers. With no way to discredit the accusations, Rex could only resort to the truth. I'm doing this because I have no choice, he shouted. I serve the Emperor because he holds my sister hostage, and even then I have served him like my own father. A father killed because of men like all of you. If I was in any way against you, why would I be here? Why would I risk my own life again and again for the Roman Empire? I am a slave still, and this is how I earn my freedom. Lord Verus, the truth is that your brother promised me your daughter in marriage if I end the civil war. There. That's all the conspiracy there is. I did not agree to his offer either. That's where it stands. Clearly I've earned no home in your empire, the empire that I preserve with my own blood every day. So we shall kill Maximus, return home, negotiate peace with the rebels, and negotiate the release of my family from the Imperial household. Everything will be as you wish. Rex fell into his chair. The officers looked at each other, feeling ashamed in the face of that tirade. Yet Ferris rallied them. As ever, you only consider yourself, he said. He announced his intention to take his forces out to defeat the Roman Asians in the field, and Rex made no protest. The tent emptied. Rex sat up there all night, wrestling rage and regret until sunlight started cooking the canopy. The following night, one of the officers from Verus's group burst back in, his helmet missing and his face bloodied with bad news. Everything went wrong. All of our allied troops decided to leave the siege and were defeated elsewhere in open battles against the Roman Asian armies, although just barely, as we'll see in a little bit. This meant that Rex was left doing the siege on his own and the siege camp was attacked by a hundred or so enemy troops. This wasn't so bad, however, because not only do we outnumber them, but our reinforcements on this map played ball. They spawned pretty near the start of the battle and they spawned right next to us. So while our initial set of defending troops were heavily damaged, we can quickly reinforce and defend our camp. Since the number of enemies isn't all that great, now we can start pushing back out of the camp to finish all of them off. There are loads of these little stake walls outside the camp, and this really played with the AI, I think. They didn't really know how to walk past them, so their force is totally broken up. You might be able to spot that down the hill to my right at the moment, there's a massive group of enemy troops, and the ones who are up here are quickly killed, even though it was nearly impossible to tell which guys were enemies. As for the guys who were stuck on the stakes, they were slowly killed by our archers, and Rex himself jumps in to finish that job off. There was a couple of guys somewhere or other, but that was pretty much the end of the fight. So victorious, we only lost something like 15 men killed and a whole load of captives, presumably captives from the battles with our allied armies, come available to us. So we can now hire all these guys. And I think in the end, we have a bigger army after that battle than we did before. However, now we're left to, to do the siege on our own. And this is pretty challenging mainly actually because of all the random events that happen. You get all these things where it ought to resolve small fights between you and the defenders. And while we're killing a whole load of the defenders in these fights, we're losing men ourselves and we are actually now outnumbered by the defenders, which is never a good thing for a besieging army. By the time you've gone through all the different auto resolve things you have to do, we lost some 70 to 100 men to all of these random events and winter attrition and things like that which didn't really sink in for me. I didn't realize that at this point, 
We have about half the enemy troops inside the fort, and I just went for the assault as soon as I could, thinking pretty confidently that we've got this, so in we go. I'm waiting for my men to go ahead of me so I'm not in amongst the enemy. Again, going to be a battle where we can't really tell what's going on because both our allies and enemies just look the same. But hopefully things are going okay. You can see there's just a mass melee going on on the wall. I'll leave them to it and order my infantry to station on the wall. The thought there was that I don't want my men to advance too far from our reinforcement point so the next wave can join them before we go into the city itself. Meanwhile, as for Rex, we're going to slash our way down the wall and just finish off these archers who were left over from the initial fight. Nearly didn't go very well, but after a little bit of micro, we take them down. So now I can spot enemy reinforcements running up those stairs over there to join the fight where our ladders are. And overall, at this stage, it's kind of over. All of those troops ahead of us are enemies. The enemy have retaken the wall, and as I open the radar up, it becomes clear what's going on. We've lost all our men and no reinforcements are showing up because I just hadn't appreciated the fact that we've lost most of our army before this fight even started. We don't have another wave of reinforcements. Our archers are being attacked outside the town because the enemy jumped down the ladders to go for them. So at this stage, I order a retreat and we lose another load of guys. In the end, a disastrous battle. Our army is pretty much gone. We lost nearly 200 guys if you count wounded. And in this case, we do need to count wounded because our army is so damaged the enemy will just go after us right now. Clearly I didn't appreciate this, for some reason after the fight I could have quit the siege and run away with our surviving wounded troops, but for some reason I continued the siege, really not sure what I was thinking with that move, it's pretty bad, and as expected all the enemy armies that are around here just jump on us now that we only have 10 guys who aren't wounded. In this case, I could have tried to use the duel trick to get away, but for some reason I didn't do that either. I surrendered to the enemy and we are taken prisoner. All of our wounded troops will be taken into the city and Rex is in trouble. Although actually this period of captivity lasted only a couple of hours. We instantly escaped, but we don't escape with our whole companion crew. It's just Rex, Eadfrith and Bagadatta. The others, save for Eithna, are inside the city with the rest of her army. Eithna is nowhere to be seen. So this is a bit of a situation. We're in trouble, but not that much trouble. We still have our entire baggage train and about 20 horses with us somehow. So we're still able to move around and fight effectively. And indeed, there's actually a target to go after right next to us. Severianus is here with only 13 men. And with just us three, there's a pretty decent chance of taking a, an army of 13 men down because Rex could probably just do it on his own. So I go after Severianus once he's away from his reinforcements. The battle begins. He tried to ambush us apparently, but it didn't work. And bang, he rides up to us, takes an arrow in the face, and his horse delivers Severianus right to us. So... <laughs> Out of the mouth of this crushing defeat, we've now captured the enemy commander. Or at least we will do if we can win the rest of the fight, which is really no problem because we just do this. Rex rides around in a circle, hacking at the enemy. Most of them didn't have weapons long enough to really challenge us, and the one guy who did was really weak, so we got away with it. And yes, we did capture Severianus, so stage one to turning this disaster around has been completed. What I wanted to do next was sneak into Antiochia and break my companions out of prison so we could put the party back together. However, the siege is still technically ongoing or something, so we don't have the option to do the sneak into town thing. After a while, I decided to just use cheats to put myself inside the town to see if we could get the prison break going. But actually, it turns out we can't. There's some kind of glitch going on where when you do the thing that normally makes the local guards hostile to you and you can start beating them up to break into the prison, they just didn't turn hostile. And because they're not hostile, I don't think I can even cheat to get rid of them. There's no way to get the keys as far as I know. That means we can't break them out of prison. This plan is a bust. One thing I could do since I was in town though is go to the tavern and there I could ask this traveler to tell me where Eithna is and he says that she's at Gerha. Gerha handily isn't that far away, so we may be able to actually get her back very soon. While I was in town, I was feeling really cheeky as well, so I decided to spend all of my money buying up land. There is some logic behind this. I'm carrying like 50,000 gold, so if I can take that out of my inventory, if our small party is defeated anytime soon, which isn't all that unlikely, we're not going to lose all that gold to the enemy, so now we've invested it safely. 
So there's Gerha, it's in Eastern Arabia, and I thought we might as well start walking that way. However, to walk that way we also have to go south, and that reminded me, we do have an ally just south of Antioch, we can go and talk to our old friend Galba. At the head of a column of a dozen horses, Rex, Eidfrith and Bagadetta rode over the arid heights north of Jerusalem, making their escape from the battlefields behind them. Flung over one of the horses was Consul Severianus, a trophy worth far more than the rest of the baggage the horses carried. Wine boss, Eidfrith offered. Rex wordlessly shook his head. This is Verus's fault, not yours, remember. Have a drink. No. Doesn't matter whose fault it is, does it? Our armies are scattered. So are theirs, Bagadatta was quick to point out. And we've got their commander. Get him back to Rome, and this rebellion falls apart. We've won, master. What if Ferris is dead? Rex snapped. What if the others are dead? He added, his energy suddenly draining away again. If it takes your mind off it, might be us dead soon, Eidfrith said. He was referring to the cloud of dust advancing towards them a few miles ahead. It was a military patrol from Roman Asia. The group thundered up to block Rex's path. Bagadatta untied Severianus and dragged him out to show off in the impending discussion. Magister Rex, I heard what happened at Antiochia. Figured you'd come this way, one of the riders called out. Come a step closer and the consul will be bled like a bull. Bagadatta called back, but at the same time Rex was taking off his helmet and stepping forward. Lugatus Galba? Rex asked. The rider at the head of the arriving group took off his helmet also, and Rex saw that his guess had been right. Galba dismounted and stood face to face with his old subordinate. Didn't hear you'd captured the consul, he began. I still have a message from him saying he defeated your army under Lucius Verus. That is true. But then, the consular army was no match for myself and my two guards. Now I'm worried that I'll have to destroy your company as well," Rex said. It sounded like a joke, but there wasn't a hint of levity in his voice, which in itself drew a laugh from Galba. You know, back when you rode with me, Severianus was scared out of his wits that you'd rebel and do something just like this. Only, as you say, turns out that when the time came, he was the rebel. You stirred the pot up a lot more than I thought. Still, I can tell you one thing. With this, Galba stepped closer to Rex and made a salute. Makes me glad I had saved your life. All that nearly cost me my own, but I thought it might just be a way to make the Empire a little more decent. Again, didn't turn out like I thought, but I guess all that matters in the end is who's gone and who's still stirring. Seeing Galba's smile changed Rex's demeanor. He stood easy and gave Bagadatta a look to get the blade away from Severianus' throat. Legatus Galba, my troops, both of them, are tired from their recent work in the Emperor's name. Please escort us to a secure location so that we can safely imprison the rebel leader, Rex said. Don't you dare listen to him, Galba, Severianus said before Bagadatta put a hand over his mouth. I figured I'd already paid off my debt to you, Rex, Galba said. But I owe the people of my land something, too. Peace. The whole empire is owed peace. So, if you're the Emperor's Magister, then I am yours to command. Severianus was trying to shout something, but he was dragged back to his horse. Revenge and a friendly face, Eidfrith remarked. Revenge, Rex replied. You've mastered your old master, Magister. This Roman Empire's a real show, tell you that much. Galba has decided to join the Magisterium under Rex. He's going to remain loyal to the Emperor and divide away from Severianus' Roman Asia. This gives us a base from which to continue our campaign against Antiochia from very close range. As for my plan, I actually decided to leave that whole area and go off to the east because now I can recruit another Persian and Armenian army to give myself not only elite troops, but perhaps more importantly, troops that distinguish us from the enemy, which will make telling what's going on a bit easier. 
It turned out I was at war with Armenia, which I didn't even realize, but a quick word with one of the King clones quickly ends that situation so now we can recruit from their population. Although in some cases the locals around here weren't so enthusiastic about being recruited from, we did get attacked in a village or two. Not that that's something we can't overcome, of course. So yes, I'm going to recruit up an army and then go back to our campaign for Antiochia. And I thought I'd add while I'm here that my plan for this campaign is pretty much to take Antiochia and then try to secure peace with the rest of Roman Asia. And that will be just about everything that I'd plan to do. So we may very soon be coming to the end of this campaign. It kind of depends how it goes and what my whims at the time are. But yes, just letting you know that some kind of ending may be coming up very soon, we shall see. It was the worst case scenario for a civil war. Both sides had been severely damaged, leaving Rome weak across the world. However, Rex had emerged from the chaos intact, with one of the rebel leaders in chains, a city taken without bloodshed, and a network of eastern connections and general fame translatable into a rapidly levied force behind enemy lines. With Regni due to give birth any day now, Rex wasn't going to return home without his mission complete and his obligations fully disposed of. That is it for this episode, thank you very much for watching and as always special thanks to the officially Devon patrons. If Maximus is in Antiochia, then no matter how many troops are still defending it, we've got to find a way in in the next episode of Rex Romanum.